right, in this video we're looking at using the central limit theorem, and then we're going to answer example 95 at the end. All right, so let's start with the central limit theorem first. So basically what this is saying is the central limit theorem states that if random samples of size n are drawn from a non-normal population with a finite mean mu and standard deviation sigma, then when n is large, the sampling distribution of the sample means is approximately normally distributed with the mean and standard deviation that are given by these expressions. So basically what we see here is that the mean for the sample means, in other words the average sample mean that we will come up with in our sampling, is going to be the same as the population mean overall. So this would mean that if we could draw you know, a huge number of samples and of size n, and then we did the average of all those samples, we would end up with the population mean. So that's kind of promising, right? Then from there we have the population standard deviation for x bar, and that's essentially saying that the standard deviation or the standard error for our estimator x bar is equal to the population standard deviation for x divided by the square root of the sample size we used in our sampling. And that's basically going to tell us how x bar will vary, right? All right, so that's important, that idea of the standard error of x bar telling us how x bar will vary. What does it mean to vary? It means differences, right? It means when you calculate one x bar from one sample, it'll probably be different from another x bar counted, calculated from a different sample of the same size. They'll be different because they have different sample points in them. However, um, they shouldn't be so greatly different, right? And the reason why is because we're gonna have this standard error quantity, which is gonna tell us roughly how it should vary, right? And so if this number is small, it means that these x-bars will be close together when we calculate them from different samples. If this number is large, it means they'll be further apart on average, right? Okay, so that's the idea. And then from here, um, we have a couple little notes. Of course, as the sample size gets closer to and closer to infinity, or as it approaches infinity, right, the approximation gets better and better. That's a, an idea that's from calculus, essentially, is the idea of a limit. And then from here we have another little thing called the finite correction factor. This correction factor uh, in the concept video we talk about and we explain that uh, it really doesn't need to be worried about in many cases. So we're not going to worry about it in every case when we have a finite population, but it is uh, technically correct. And then from there I want to talk about uh, this last piece here, which is you know, the central limit theorem applies to the summation of x, not just to x bar, right? It'll work for x bar, but it also works for the summation of x because actually um, the only thing that's different from x bar and the summation of x is that you divide this quantity by n to get the average or x bar, right? So since n is a chosen value that you choose ahead of time and it has no kind of randomness associated with it, it doesn't affect the overall statements that are here. And then finally, there's one other thing that's important. Um, we talked about if the original population was not normal, that you could have this approximately uh, normally distributed result as long as the sample size was large. By the way, that large here, we usually use about 30 as the cutoff for large, so more than 30 we'll consider large, right? All right, but going back to uh, this idea, you know, we talked about non-normal populations. Well, what if your original population where you draw your samples from is already normal? Well, if it's already normal, then no matter the sample size, whether it's large or small, your distribution of the sample mean will be exactly normal. So it won't matter the size of the sample then. Even if you take a sample of two, if the original population is normal, the distribution of the sample mean x bar will be exactly normal. Not approximately normal, but exactly normal. Okay, and then the last thing I want to mention is that these quantities, the mean for x bar and the standard deviation for x bar, they actually don't depend on the sample size. So it doesn't matter the sample size, those are always your values for the mean and the standard deviation. The only question or, or thing that depends on the sample size is whether or not it's normal or not. Okay, all right, great. So um, hopefully with the concept video and what we just said here, this will all make sense to you. Now let's ask a practical question, one that's kind of important. Looking at this question, Example 95, it asks very simply, how does the standard deviation of x compare to the standard error of the mean? And what we mean here is the sample mean, of course, the standard error only makes sense when you're speaking of a sample mean. Okay, so let's talk about that and see what the answer is. Well, you know that for a particular value, right, that, so say you have a distribution where the standard deviation is sigma, so let's say, um, for x, let the population standard deviation be equal to sigma, right? So it's going to make that to be true. Now, that would mean that 
x's standard deviation is given by sigma, how does that compare to the standard deviation for x bar, which would result from samples of size n, right? So samples of size n are taken and we form sample means from the original population where x comes from. How do these two uh, measures of variation compare? Well, I think if you look at the formulas, you will see that this comparison is such that it's always in this direction, always that the variation or standard deviation in x will always be greater than the standard deviation for x bar or for groups of values when you're looking at the sample mean. All right, and the reason why is because the formula for this guy is very simple. It's just sigma, right? Whereas this guy is the same sigma divided by the square root of the sample size no matter what the sample size is, right? So if the sample size is, you know, two, it's still gonna be something bigger than, you know, smaller than it was originally because if you take the square root of two and divide it into sigma, you're gonna get a smaller number as a result. So it'll always be true as long as n is two or higher, and it has to be, of course, if you're taking a sample. If you take a sample of one, you're not really taking a sample, right? You're just looking at an individual x value. But anytime n is two or more, this quantity will be smaller than that quantity, right? Because you'll be dividing this sigma by some positive number here. All right, so that's the answer to the, to the question here. So essentially, x bar doesn't vary as much as the individual values of the variable x do, right? So groups, you know, when you look at their averages, group averages uh, don't vary nearly as much as individuals. And I think we spoke about this in the concept video, but just to explain why, again, there's another quick example. Think about average test scores for a class versus individual test scores for a class. We know if you had multiple classes of the same section, let's say like 21, 22, a stats, intro to stats class, if you looked at multiple exam two averages for different classes, you would see that essentially those averages are pretty close to each other. They might all be around C grades, for example, on average. But when we look at the individual students in the class, they would have lots and lots of variations. Some people would fail, some people would achieve perfection on the test, get hundreds, others would get Cs, you know, so there'd be a lot of variation in the individual scores. But when you look at the class averages as a whole, they're all going to be roughly around, you know, say between a narrow band between 60 and 80, right? Never varying too far from those places. So the variation in the sample means for classes, right, so groups of students would always be smaller than the variation you would find for individual student grades. Okay, so hopefully that explains it, and uh, from there we're going to learn to apply this concept of central limit theorem in actual problems, and we'll do that next.